I asked him about it and he said he'd been watching the tapes again for any clues. No wonder he was still creeped out. That night when I got home I got a phone call from Chris. He was whispering and said that he thought he saw someone walking around his backyard. Two days later, that Friday, I agreed to sleep over and see for myself. Chris was claiming to see glimpses of someone standing or walking around in his backyard, but it was always too dark to see any details on those previous nights. I was set up to sleep on a couch that was on the now reboarded up hole we first found the tapes in. Very little sleeping actually went on that night because we stayed up in the living room, staring out the sliding glass door to the backyard. We were talking about how we weren't even sure if Butcher Face actually hurts people when Chris suddenly leans forward and points out the window and said, See? Right there! Do you see that shadow or something? I jumped up and flipped on the switch to the deck lights, but they didn't turn on. We got flashlights and went out to look. Besides some tree branches blowing in the wind, we found nothing. At around 4 a.m., we decided to get some sleep. I only stayed on the couch a couple of hours. I got too cold because I felt a draft that I think was coming up between the boards on the floor. I went home the next afternoon thinking the night before was a dud, until I got a frantic phone call that night. Someone had broken into Chris's house while they were out. The sliding glass door to the backyard was completely smashed with broken glass having been thrown all the way across the living room and into the dining room. I drove back there because they wanted me as a witness to seeing a shadow in the backyard the night before. They showed me around and I saw that this person had completely tossed the living room, dining room and kitchen. In the bathroom, the mirror over the medicine cabinet had been smashed and all the meds were missing. Something else was missing which was a lot more disconcerting. Four knives had been removed from the knife holder in the kitchen. I stayed there for about an hour and decided to go home, and it was only after I had left that I realized that the butcher face tapes were never mentioned to the cops. A little while after I got home, I got another call from Chris saying that they had found the missing knives under the blankets of each of the family members' beds. That weekend, Chris and his father decided to look around the house more thoroughly to see if Butcher Face had left any other clues to his former presence in the house. I came over to help and the only room they said they'd never thoroughly looked in since getting the house was the attic, so we decided to start there. It didn't take long to find anything because almost immediately I came across an old looking trash bag in one of the corners. I picked it up and heard the tinkling sound of glass against glass. We brought it downstairs and cut it open, and found it completely full of liquor bottles and used syringes. Using rubber gloves, we removed every object one at a time. It was almost all bottles and syringes, and the occasional bit of trash, until we got to the bottom. At the bottom of the bag, we found a shoebox. It was stained and worn, and we couldn't even see the brand of shoe that used to be in it. We carefully took it out and removed the top, which seemed to have been glued closed. Inside was a series of papers and photos. The photos were pretty disturbing. One was a close-up of a hand covered in pins, those ones with the long point with the tiny ball of colored plastic at one end. There were so many of them that it looked like a porcupine. Another one had a presumably dead dog lying on the ground. All we could really see of its surroundings was the dirt on the ground because it was too dark. We assumed it was dead because it was missing half its face. The flesh on the side of the face that was facing the camera was gone, making it look like it was smiling with a lidless eye. There were a lot more pictures, including a cow with blood on its mouth, a very pale looking foot various 70s and 80s era toys, a collection of knives, a hand and arm painted multiple colors like patchwork, and a close-up of an eyeball. The papers were pretty freaky as well. They were a combination of drawings and writings. Most of the writings were what seemed like a wish list of murder, listing practically every imaginable way how to kill people. 
Others seemed to be random thoughts, like how he accidentally pissed his pants while at the movies, or how he has an infectious evil, and that he'll spread that to his disciples. Some of the drawings were pretty similar to the ones seen on some of the tapes on the walls in Chris's old room. Others were more detailed and showed corpses in various states of decay and of strange creatures. They were humanoid, but they all had a demonic look to them, with many of them shown standing on all fours. One thing that showed up often was a strange symbol. It looked like the letter C, with the gap in the C pointing down, with a V laid on top of it. When we got to the bottom of the box, we found another tape, one that we'll never get to watch because it was completely coated in candle wax. Running out of clues, we decided to revisit the old women who owned the house in the 80s. It had been almost two months since we last visited them, and we came to realize that their story didn't quite make sense. For instance, Louise claimed to have given up on the house, yet on the tapes we could see that the house had power. Why would she have continued paying the power bill if she didn't want the house? They also mentioned that homeless people had been regularly arrested or chased off the property by the cops, but we found no record of this. We tried calling them, but just like last time, we got no answer, so we decided to drop by again. When we got there, we found the house abandoned. We went next door and asked the neighbor if they knew where the two old ladies that lived next door had gone. They told us that Louise had died about three weeks earlier, but they didn't know how, and Shirley abruptly packed up and moved away a week later. While Chris's father was talking to the neighbor, Chris pulled me aside and whispered, We're breaking into that house. That same night, we waited until it was late and drove to the old lady's former house. We had never broken into a house before in our lives, and we were dressed in the stereotypical burglar outfit black shirt and pants, and a black mask. When we got to the house, we were so nervous that we didn't even leave the car for a good 45 minutes. When we felt assured that the neighborhood was asleep, we got out of the car and crept into the backyard and up to the back door. We looked in the window of the door, but it was too dark to see anything. I took my shirt off and put it up against the window and gave it a punch, breaking the glass. It felt surprisingly loud, but that could have been because it was so quiet, and the neighbors never woke up, so I guess it really wasn't that loud. I reached in through the hole in the glass and unlatched the door. Then we had a whispered fight over who will go in first. It actually came down to a game of rock-paper-scissors, which I won, so Chris went in first. We crept in, hunched over, and I closed the door behind me, accidentally slamming it giving Chris a good jump that we couldn't help laughing over. We snuck around the house with our flashlight shining over the walls. As a side note, I really don't see how much they would have fixed up Chris's house when they had it, because this one looked like crap. The wallpaper was probably older than me and Chris combined. Anyway, we went into the living room and found a huge pile of trash lying in the far corner with a depression in the middle like a person or a large dog had used it as a bed. We went upstairs and found something that connected this house to Chris's. In one of the bedrooms was a pile of pill bottles. Some of the pill bottles were the ones stolen from Chris's bathroom medicine cabinet. We knew this because some of them had his mother and father's name on them, and one of them was Chris's back pain medicine. That was all we needed to see, so we booked it back down the stairs and ran to the door. But when we got to the door, I jumped back, knocking both me and Chris down. On the inside of the back door was the CV symbol from Butcher Face's notes. After we got back to the car, Chris said something that creeped both of us out. If Butcher Face really is living in that house, he probably wasn't there because he was staking out Chris's house right now. Later that week, I visited Chris's house again, and as soon as I walked into the door, I knew I walked into an air of distress. Chris's mother and brother were pacing back and forth in the living room, looking out the window into the backyard. I walked in and asked what was going on, 
and looked out the window and saw Chris and his father in the backyard screaming at each other and behind them was a large bonfire that was almost nothing more than cinders. Chris's mother said their dog Brackett had gone missing but didn't say anything else. I opened the newly repaired sliding glass door and walked out to meet them. As soon as Chris's father saw me, he became even angrier. Chris met me halfway to the fire and said, I had to tell them that we broke into that house. I asked why and he said that he thinks that Butcher Face took their dog as payback for breaking into his home. I asked about the fire and Chris told me that what his father was burning was Butcher Face's notes, photos and tapes. Everything had been burned to ashes. During this time, his father had walked up behind him and said, I'm going to end this right now. I'm burning everything so that you guys can't get into any more trouble. As he said this, he continued past us and into the back door of his garage and came back with a shovel, adding, And I'm burying the ashes to put this to rest for good, and started digging a hole in the back of his yard close to the woods. Chris pulled me back into the house into the basement and started talking about how all of this was unfair. How could his father just burn tapes like that? They were so close to figuring out who Butcher Face was, etc. Then his mother called for us from upstairs. We came up and she pointed out the door to his father who had stopped digging and was looking into the hole he had just dug. We walked outside and crossed the yard to the hole that his father was still looking into. When we got to it, we realized why he was frozen there, because just a couple feet into the hole was what turned out to be over 30 skeletons of cats, dogs, and other animals. This is when we started calling him Butcher Face. After Chris's father burned Butcher Face's media, including the art and photos and tapes, I think everyone, including me, hoped that Chris would let it go. I know I was willing to let it go, but it wasn't long after that Chris began looking for any evidence of other media by Butcher Face. He would occasionally talk, just to me, about strange tapes and art found in other parts of the country, but most of it seemed sketchy, which even Chris was completely willing to admit. My attitude began to change about looking into Butcher Face around this time when I was sitting at my desk and caught myself absentmindedly drawing Butcher Face's CV symbol on a piece of paper. Roughly two weeks after Chris's dog disappeared and his father burned all evidence of Butcher Face, Chris showed up on my doorstep saying he wanted to go back to the house we found that was on the tapes. When we first found it, no one was home. We showed up at the house around 6 p.m. on a Wednesday, hoping that anybody living there would be home from work. We went to the door and knocked. The person who answered the door was a man in his 50s. It turned out that he actually did live in the house in the mid-80s when we believed the tapes were shot. We told him about the tapes and how his house was on them and asked if anything strange had happened around that time. He said that they didn't notice anything like what was on the tapes, but there was a point when they realized that someone had been living in their shed in the backyard. The shed had since been torn down, but he did remember that there was a carving left on the doorframe. We asked him what it was, and he pulled out a pad of paper and drew the CV symbol. The very next day, Chris's mother was walking around in their backyard and came across their dog. He had been ripped open from the neck to the stomach and placed in the still open hole his father had dug two weeks earlier. The cops had been called and they were finally told about Butcher Face. Since Chris's father had burned everything, they really had no evidence that the dog had been killed by a person and labeled it an animal mauling. It wasn't long after that that I came home to find my front door open. I walked up the front steps and saw that the door was swung open, only hanging on one hinge. It being dark out, I flipped the light switch just inside the door and it didn't come on. I went around the house to the shed in the backyard and grabbed the most menacing thing I could that was near the door, which was a pitchfork. Going back to the front door, I pulled out my cell phone and called 911. After making the call, I cautiously entered the house, making sure the pitchfork was in front of me. 
I crept up the stairs and got to the nearest light switch and flipped it, but this one wasn't working either. I came to the conclusion that the power was cut. Using my cell phone as a flashlight, I got a look at the damage done 